Yeah. Sort of, kind of. If you get boring, we'll come. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm real with it today. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Okay, I actually am with it today. I think I'm. In any case, um, Apple had delayed the release of their HomePod. It, it is now out and available. One of our members has a HomePod, okay? And so, if you remember, Rick Cartwright always sits in the back and gives me the glaring looks when I say something that's not actually correct. Anyway, he's going to do a presentation next month for the group on home automation. Home automation. Now, for me, I always think of, there's a, a cartoon that I like to post on my Facebook account, and it's 1960s, shh, the government may be listening, you know, be careful what you say, and then the, underneath it's current day, it's, hey, wiretap, do you have a recipe for Swedish pancakes? meaning one of these voice-actuated devices that you can talk to and order yourself and tell it to change the radio channel, unlock the garage, all that kind of stuff. Well, that's all part of this home automation, Internet of Things, and, and Rick will be enlightening us about that. Um, the month after that, let me turn this down just a little bit. There we go. The month following, which will be January, February, March, April, will be April. I'll be doing a presentation on what's called mesh network equipment. This is uh, the the next stage of Wi-Fi, if you will. Um, you, how many of you know that Apple is no longer manufacturing or making new network devices? The time capsules the Airport Extreme, the Airport Express, they're getting out of that market. Uh, they're selling uh, a product from Linksys in their stores while they you know, use up to what they have left of their, their stocking. Uh, that's mesh computing, and basically it's a router and a satellite, at least one and they talk to each other to get better coverage over your house and to be able to handle more devices. And this is sort of a, it's going to be a real world concern for people. At least it was for me at Christmas. We were hosting the kids this year. So all three of my kids, adult kids, came back with their plus ones and my granddaughter. And they bring their devices with them. And wasn't feeling real good, even though we were hosting. All I want to do was just sort of like stare at the fire, <laughs> drink eggnog, and they're going, Dad, network's down again. They basically they were overloading my network, my Apple devices, my older Apple devices. So I ended up buying an Orbi system from Netgear and putting that in. But we'll, we'll leave more information about it for people. But it is getting to the point where. It's time for many people, they have quite a few devices, to start migrating over to uh, mesh wireless systems from the traditional wireless systems. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that the local internet providers, both AT&T and Spectrum, uh, AT&T, it's a minimum of 20 megabit now, that in terms of the speed that they're providing. Uh, the minimum, I believe, with Spectrum is now 100 megabit. Some of the older cable modems and older routers can't handle that much stuff. So uh, you know, sometime in the next two years or so, you're probably going to have to buy a new Netflix equipment. So it's good to know about this stuff. And have to to OK, I'm trying to think of what else, if anything, new and wonderful that's been going on. Oh! Disclaimer, I own the Apple stock. With the, uh, the Apple shareholders meeting, I you know, was in on the web broadcast so I could watch that. And there was a commitment made, not just by the uh, president of Apple, Tim Cook, but also 
several of the other vice presidents of Avanza, that they're going to sort of hold back on new features in the operating system for the next 18 to 24 months while they focus on getting bugs out. Okay, so we'll see, we'll see what comes of that. Um, and, and I know you don't want to hear me kvetch again about how uh, quality of phone fit on Apple's software interfaces is not in all that it should be. You know, it's supposed to just work. Um, so anyway, I just mentioned that to you. And then there's the typical stuff that's out there, Apple, Samsung litigation that was, you know, going on six years ago is still going on. They're still fighting over whether it's going to be $20 billion that Samsung gives Apple or whether it's going to be, you know, $4.99. Let's see, I'm trying to go what else. Boom, 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 boom. How about the iPhone battery replacement program? Mm. Oh, yeah. iPhone 6 and above battery replacement? Um, what do you know about, because uh, I was telling people to immediately go in and get their batteries replaced, and then when they went in, they were calling me and saying, no, no, you have to schedule it. And well, either way, I mean, you get a new battery for 30 bucks. Yeah. Um, some of the repair sites have lowered all their battery prices to match that now. Uh, so if you want to do it yourself, don't. Uh, don't replace your own battery. Uh, if you were, somebody would do that. The prices have come down also. Um, this iPhone 6. iPhone 6, go ahead. Somebody was saying something about iPhone No, I said, is this for iPhone 6 and above? iPhone 6 above. and, yeah. Uh, it's not for the 4s or the 5s. So you go into the Apple store and they replace Replace your battery? Correct. Yeah, twenty nine twenty nine within the point. Yeah. I spent about eight hours at the Apple store the other day getting my phone checked on something else. Probably about ninety percent of the people coming in to get work done were there to get their battery replaced. So if you're gonna do it, you really want to use the Apple support app to schedule and visit yeah. okay. because you would totally avoid because they were just they couldn't do it. They were just yeah. too many people. So, so if you schedule it and save some time and it's good to the end of the year. So if your battery is partly good, you might be better off to wait till November, October, or something, because it's all the way to the end of the year. So it's new when you get it. You get it now. You know, just think about when you do it. Yes, Ron. I understood that Apple, in their operating system, slowed down or put in put in code to slow down the operation of the phone. Uh, to avoid overloading the battery. If, if you get a new battery, does that change? Do you, so. do you get the, the higher speed? I think it's monitoring the battery. Yeah. And it knows the battery's not. When it starts getting down low. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, it slows. It, avoids, it slows the processor to avoid sucking. It's like not slow down so the lights don't dim and the processor crash. So, so don't let it overload. So getting the battery replaced doesn't change that. Well, no, because your battery is going to be fresh. It, the it should know it has more power. I believe. It's yeah, like, it's not. It's, it's not a every phone is going to be measures. slowed down. It's going to be slowed down on the basis of the it's state of condition. The battery. Condition of the battery. Yeah. Their thinking was, and by the way. They, they are appearing in all sorts of government tribunals in the Pacific Rim, in the Eurozone, the Canadians are on their case, the Mexicans want to have, you know, talks with Apple about this also. Apple's thinking, the engineer's thinking was, it's better to slow down a phone in terms of its operation <coughs> than to have it suddenly just die because, you know, you're, you're, uh, it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon, you're at your office, and all of a sudden your iPhone just goes, you know, and wants to be recharged. Yeah. A segue on that. Uh, 
No, a Segway is a, a Steve Wozniak <laughs> no, transportation not device. But this is a little battery where I'm charging my phone right now. Yes. And uh, you know, if, so if you look at this, uh, about half this size, uh, I do a lot of things for amusement. And there's a website called met.com, meh.com. They're like, they're like Whoop used to be. They sell one product a day. Okay. Anyhow, today they have four little battery packs for 20 bucks plus $5 shipping. So if anybody needs a, an emergency battery to put in their purse or their car where they don't have you know, the, a charging capability uh, available, and you can get four of them for $20, which I think is a pretty good deal. Meh.com. M-E-H as in meh. Yeah. yeah. As opposed to Woot. <laughs> Since Amazon, yeah. Since Amazon bought Woot, Woot is 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 not so good. Yeah. Okay. Not so good. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, Lynda.com for free. Oh, mm -hmm. wow. Uh, that's $250 a year for a basic membership. Years ago, um, they would give out uh, maybe a 40% off, and it would be for one year, and then they'd want you to pay full price. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a nice deal. If any of you know Lynda.com, L-Y-N-D-A, and they it's now owned by Microsoft. And uh, now I don't know how they do it in Lebanon. I know in Washington Centerville Public Library, uh, it's also available okay. to if you're a patron and you have a library card. Okay. Uh, they expect you to use your LinkedIn credentials to log into it. Yeah. 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 Which is also now owned by Microsoft. It's also available from the right memorial. Oh, no. Link, did he mean okay. like LinkedIn, the, the company? No. Okay. How about they? Yeah. Yeah. They, they, yeah. they did. Yeah. Well, yeah. We're in Lebanon. Is it hard in, to get into? Sign in. which, is, which is better. I like single sign-in. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to do your library card number sign-in. I didn't catch your reference to LinkedIn. No, there was no sign-up for LinkedIn. OK, so it's single sign-in. You use the I, library I went, card and you're in. I, I, Yes, but I, I did it the easy way. I went to the library and somebody looked over my shoulder and and I probably would have messed up two times yeah. during that sign up process if I'd not had help. Okay. But once you what signed up, okay. Oh, it's, it's an education site you can take courses in. Uh, it's not like you don't get graded. Free courses in. Um, Technology of all kinds, including um, you know, photography, computers, software, design, Adobe, all yeah. of the Adobe products, and then there are also uh, Microsoft certification about fourteen hundred different courses, simply in business applications as well. And, and you um, can't name a hobby that there isn't some kind of a reference to almost yeah. in there. I mean, it, everybody ought to at least go once and take a look at it. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you're yeah, still in a work environment. You know, it's how to time productivity. Now I'm retired. I don't have classes on how to be more productive with your Where use of time. Uh, how to properly interact oh, with your uh, co-workers. All sorts of management. If you're managing, you know, people, you know, better management techniques. Yeah. At one point, they even had some of the uh, 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 statistical quality control stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, the black belt, yeah. green belt, whatever they call it. Sigma, Sigma, Sigma software. Six Sigma. Just unbelievable. Um, for those who are not into that kind of stuff, they have training videos on using Quicken, QuickBooks, um, Great Plains, their accounting software. Uh, Unbelievable amount. They originally started out as a company that would do uh, training courses for companies 
Then they went, instead of us just doing it individually for companies, no, how about we record these bottom. people and have the videos available then I need for purchase on DVD? Then, you know, the internet comes and they start selling it over the, uh, over the internet. Do you want to do and then they go, oh, wait a minute, why have the stuff on discs that we have to produce if we can just put a meter and they can watch it over the internet? Do it that way. So, Unbelievable resource. I'm trying to downsize so just to check. L-Y-N-D-A dot C-O-M. And I know Big Montgomery, Washingtonville Public Library, Green County, Lebanon, Oakwood, and I don't know, Yellow Springs is, do you, green do you yeah. consider yeah. yourself yeah. in Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I say probably the best bet though is don't try to go to Lynda.com. Go to your library yeah. and then look for Lynda. Yeah. If you go to Lynda.com, they'll sign you up. Correct. What, what you want to do is go to your local library. Disclaimer, my wife is uh, a trustee of Washington Center Public Library. Go to your local library, find that reference desk, and tell them how wonderful they are, and you want to know if they can help you sign up, you know, be able to get access to lynda.com through the library. That way it's free to you. Um, something else uh, that's to available, I don't know about Lebanon, but Washington Central Public Library, they now have do you need hot some spots wood? that you can check out for a period of time. So this is account. using Sprint telephone technology. It you carry the hotspot wherever you go, get the connection to the internet via a cell phone connection. And it's the library pays the, the connection already. costs. Okay. And I think you can have them out for like uh, 10 days at a time. Green County has it too. Green County has it too. Okay. Could you explain again what it is? I'm sorry, I don't quite understand. What's a hotspot that you get? Oh, a hotspot. Okay. It's a little device, okay, and typically they're from cell phone companies. And in this case, instead of you buying it and paying for the service, you're checking it out from the library. Once you're out of the library, when you turn it on, your devices can talk to it, and it then connects them to the internet through cell phone technology. Okay. So, so you have to remember, not everybody in the world has a cell phone-enabled uh, mobile device where they've got an internet connection. A lot of people have the old flip phones. So if you're going on a trip and you've got your uh, Toshiba Satellite Pro <laughs> uh, laptop that's got Wi-Fi, but it's running, you know, Windows Windows XP. And you're going to go on a trip, you're going to be out in the boonies, and you don't want to stop at a McDonald's or whatever to do your internet. This hotspot, you get to the place, you turn on the hotspot, your laptop or your other device talks to it, it then connects you to the internet. If but you have to range. return it back to the library at the end of the period. Yes? Does it's anybody have any idea how robust these hotspots are? I mean, can we bring one here to the meeting and everybody could connect to it? Or no, no. Would it no, be they're so not small? They're, they're meant for uh, one to two, maybe, maybe three devices. Uh, and again, it's, but it's better than nothing. Right. Okay. I mean, it's better than Herbert. If, if, yes, sir. If you've already got a cellular cell phone, you don't have any advantage at all from hotspot? No. Because your cell phones, most modern cell phones now that are smartphones, you can tell your smartphone to become a hotspot and then you can have your other device talk to it. It then connects it to the internet. Then you pay for data. Correct. And you pay for data. You always pay. And it's a cell. But when you're using the library hotspot, they pay for your data. They pay for the kind of Taxpayers are paying as well. We'll see. It's up. It's up. We'll see how long it lasts. You're paying for it. Yeah, you're paying for it. All right. Anybody else have any other comments about Lynda.com, hotspots, cell phone? Just, just on library, uh, Lena pointed out to me too that um, at least the Washington Township Library, and I'm guessing others, um, have access to a service called Hoopla, 
which is a virtual video rental uh, service. So uh, if you're not interested in education, via Linda, and you just want some entertainment, uh, you can get Google Hoopla. Housework has another thing called Freegal, mm -hmm. which is music. Hmm. Um, I think it's somewhere around um, a million and a half songs that they've got on it. Five tracks a week. And you can either... Five tracks a week. Oh, that's a good one. What do you mean five tracks a week? You can, five you can download five songs a week. You can download five tracks and then keep them? Or? And, and you can keep them. Huh. Yeah. But, See, but you know, you're talking to somebody. I've, I've got all these library accounts, all these different places. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it's through um, your account. And there's also from. Okay, you know, I'm thinking this would be a good thing to put together a cheat sheet for everybody on. What services are provided by local libraries in terms of audio books? It's like I, I recently was in. Uh, a local library, I won't say which one, but they went, oh, Mr. Herrick, we haven't seen you in so long. And I go, well, yeah, because I go there all the time, but I'm doing it via the internet and downloading audio books or e-books. You know, I'm not physically in the building, but I am using their library service. Yes, Bill? One more tidbit. How many people in here have Amazon Prime? Yeah. I was listening to a uh, Kim Commando podcast, and she was talking about the fact that she just recently found out that if you've ever ordered a CD, like if you order a CD, a vinyl record, anything on Amazon, any time in the past, within your Amazon Prime Music, your, your free account, that yeah, that song or that album or that DVD is also available. Yeah. And you can download it for free as well. So yeah. if you ever bought your family members Christmas gift that was a DVD or music album they wanted or anything like that on Amazon. It's still available for you to download, use now, or listen to if you want on Amazon Prime. And then yeah. I thought it was kind of cool. The other thing I would also mention, because a lot of people don't know this, but if you are do you have an Amazon Prime account, you also have access to all sorts of video, movies, TV shows versus Amazon Prime Video. And you now have a, an app that is available on the Apple set-top devices, the Apple TVs, where you can be playing those movies through your Apple TV. If you've got a Roku, there's a, an app that you can put on to bring those in. I mean, you're already paying the, for the Prime membership. You might as well be watching Mr. Robot or some of the other things that are available. Battlestar Galactic. I think of what else I uh, Robo, Robotech, and Astro Boy cartoons I used to watch as a kid. On well, the music here. side, too, anything that you have ever purchased, you can yeah. download and put it on your playlist and carry it with you. So yeah. you don't have to have internet access. Or if you have an Amazon Drive app on your mobile device, you don't have to download it, you can stream it, right? assuming that you've got a, a good data package where it's not going to cost you an arm and a leg. All sorts of things. Time sponges, okay. Yeah, just one more thing on uh, libraries, a little bit off topic. Uh, and on behalf of my other new latest club, uh, the Miami Valley Astronomical Society, they've been working to get telescopes into the libraries. They have telescopes you can check out. And which library is there? Uh, I know Green County has some, I do not know about others, wow. but that is uh, something that is happening. Um, if you are one of the people, part of the movement of make, making stuff, uh, Dave Montgomery County has uh, 3D printers that are available uh, that you can uh, check out, shovels, jackhammers, uh, all sorts of different stuff. I, I, I don't know exactly what range it is. So I think what they do is they make an arrangement with a rental company. To acquire it for you. Um, but somebody was telling me that they had an ultrasonic water cutter that they were able to. And I was, well, Green County Library also has a maker space. You okay. can go in there and develop stuff. You can print out huge banners. They have a studio where you can do recordings. It's all free. And 
Yeah. 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 Okay. So anyway, lots of resources at your library. It's not just books and magazines and newspapers anymore. Lots of other stuff. Okay. Um, let's move. Yes, Bill. Just for your information on the break, the uh, internet connection is fluctuating in and out. It's down. Here. Right it's down right now. So. Okay. So. Um, thought we need to restart it or what? No. Yeah, the problem is I have no access to that at all. Let me try and log in to it. You're doing the GSLC Mac Club? Yeah. No, it's down. You're right. Uh, the password is supposed to be Apple Access. Okay. All right, come on, people. Suck it up. You can last 45 minutes. <laughs> And if you can, I know, who's got the best data package with your cell phone? We'll turn them into, okay. So, Bill, turn on your hotspot on your phone. <laughs> Bill, did you see that thing where there was, a, I think, a wrestling meet in a high school, and the electricity went out, and everybody turned their cell phones, flashlights on, and finished the meet? Oh, now, see, now that that's self-sufficiency. Add down in favor. That's, that's a good thing. All right, let's move on to help desk. Have people been having problems? Okay, let's see. We'll start with you. Okay, just you're always quiet. You, you're, you're always, okay, we're going to start with you. Well, at your suggestion some time ago, I've been using Clean My Mac from the Mac Box book. Okay. So I, I wonder what you think about Gemini 3, the one that all Mac Box also says, also has, to uh, get rid of uh, um, okay, Gemini. Yeah. Um, it's been my experience that whenever you use an automated system to clear out duplicates, somehow, some way, the wrong file gets tossed. So the way, and I use Gemini. I used Gemini originally and Gemini 2, which are, I took over Gemini 3. Anyway, so what I do is I use it to show me where it thinks the duplicates are, but I don't have it do it, I do it. So I actually, no, but it's not that onerous. If you think about it, you have a function, if you're doing this on a Mac computer, it's called Quick Look. So, you can tell Gemini to show you where it is on that hard drive, that storage device. You click on it in Finder, tap your space bar. If it's a movie, it'll start to play it. If it's a song, it'll start to play it without opening any programs. Okay. And that allows you to rather quickly be able to tell, okay, yeah, they actually are the same thing. Or if it's a PDF, you can open them in Quick Look very quickly be able to look at the two. And the reason why I sort of am emphasizing using Quick Look as opposed to opening it in, uh, in the case of PDF files, instead of opening it in Preview or an Acrobat uh, uh, reader file of some sort, is that different programs will show files differently. But a Quick Look is sort of giving you the plain vanilla version of it. So you're seeing this without the other tools. It, it's just a, a more efficient way to be able to go through stuff. So how do you activate Quick Look? You click on the thing. Yeah. OK. So you're in Finder, and you click on the, let's say it's a, it's a PDF you yeah. download, which is kind of wrong. And you got like eight of them, and it's PDF, blah, 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 and one, two, three, and four. You click on it. Tap your space bar. Space bar, okay. You know, the biggest key on the key. Okay. <laughs> Tap the space bar. <laughs> and it will open it up and, and show you what it is. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then when you're done, you just tap your space bar again and it un it oh. makes it go away. Then you click on the other thing which you think is yeah. a duplicate and you tap the space bar. It's really good. All these medical forms, you, you 
Now, if you're downloading a bill or something from a medical insurance company, it always seems like you get about eight of them in there because, I don't know. And this is a way that you can quickly see, oh yeah, it is the same form, you throw the other ones away, just keep the one that you need. Okay. But it works with music, it works with, uh, with videos, it works with uh, PDFs, it works with uh, uh, spreadsheet files. Can you get to it? Yeah, it's, it's built into the finder. How, how do you do it? Can you, can you use it separate from the finder? Like no, it's part of the finder. It's actually, no, where I'm headed is, yeah. I don't trust preview anymore because it likes to modify things. If okay. I type it there, keystroke. Okay. So I'm looking for a read-only viewer. Okay. Big screen. All right, so Bill sits down. And he clicks on this file, and it's called Agenda RTF. I want to know what it is, but you know, I want to be careful. I don't want to open it in the program it's designed for because it might have something else in it. I tap my space bar. The operating system is showing me what it looks like. And if I need to open it and actually do something, this is a look-only function. In this upper corner here, it says, oh, do you want to open it with text edit? So that's if I want to modify the file. I want to make changes to it. Now, if I just want to look at it, and then I don't want to look at it, I just tap my space bar again. So let's do a, let's do a little search here. Let's search for anything without PDF. OK, excuse me here. Let me do it. Finder window, thank you. And I want to look at my whole user space, and I'm looking for anything without PDF. Okay, so now the Finder is showing me all these different files. So here's one, it's a file. I just want to look at it. I don't want to necessarily open it in uh, a real program. So it's three common mistakes new court cutters can make. Okay. So I go, oh, okay, that's what that is. What's this thing down here? Oh, 10 steps to maximize. Okay. Bill, what's this one? No. Hmm? If you just push the down arrow, it'll go all the way down each one, step by step by step. Yeah. The thing is that when you're in a situation where you're trying to make sure to see if this is a duplicate or not. Oh, okay. It's better to have it where you're looking at them as separate objects, you know, and you're going like, okay, I got all these presentations. Are they duplicates of the same presentation? Well, I'll click on this one first. I'll tap my space bar. Oh, notice I'm opening a PowerPoint presentation to look at it. I don't have to have Microsoft Office on my computer to do this. It's all being done through the magic of the Mac operating system. And yeah, if I do that, okay, it's going to, let me do this. Yeah, up and down arrows will move me through. Just, I find if I'm looking for duplicates, I'm going to be real careful that I'm throwing away the correct one, not the wrong one. Yeah, I do. Yeah, Bill. Show them how to do an advanced uh, search with more than one criteria. And uh, I use it all the time. That way you can, within these dates, uh, a certain kind of a file name or certain ending on the file or created by a certain app. It's, it's, it's so much better than you know, looking at a little one thing at a time like that. Now, let's pretend, how many of you are still working in the office or something? Okay, all right, so we're focusing on those four people. That are still, I uh, suppose, that those of us that are working jobs, and we just come in three days a week. Um, you're, you do a search, okay? And then next week, your boss asks you to do the same search. Show me all the PDF, you know, show me all the PDFs that are for this project, blah, blah, blah. And the next week, they ask you to do the same thing. Not only can you search for these things, show me all PDFs that came in between this date and that date that are within this size range, or et cetera, et cetera, and that have this word somewhere in the PDF. But you can also save that search 
and it'll appear as a folder on your desktop. And dynamically, as the data on your computer changes, the stuff that met that criteria also changes. So you, instead of having a search, you just have a search folder. So when you want to look at this up, you just click on the folder. Yeah, here's the stuff. Send it to the boss. Now let me go get my coffee. So it automatically updates? Yeah. Yes, it's dynamic. It's not static. It's like the uh, smart playlist in iTunes. You know, you can create a playlist where you drag songs in, or you can create a playlist where you say, anything by Steely Dan, okay, that's, you know, with a release date of 1994 to 1998. Okay, you know, the early stuff, and they were still doing the jazz before they started doing the other. And as you move stuff on and off of your computer or in and out of iTunes, that, that playlist will automatically update. So like if you just put in, you know, three more albums of Steely Dan stuff, it'll show up in that search. Okay. I don't want to do it right now because you gotta sort of, you know, it's one of these things you've got to sort of repeat. Can you do the search in split screen? Um Okay, explain how you would do this, why you would want to. You're, you're trying to find out if you have duplicates. Look two up. So you bring up two documents side by side and split screen. No, but there's programs that will let you do that other than Finder that will use Quick Look. Okay. Uh, usually when, you, when you've got the sort of situation where uh, there's, there's a four terabyte hard drive and there's all sorts of photos and other things on it. For that kind of stuff, you really want to use a program like Gemini. Because it's looking at attribute of what was called metadata. So let's say you have a photograph. It could have two entirely different names on the computer. All right. So you can't do it on the basis of the name. You'd have to look at it, right? Well, no. If it's got metadata, such as where it was taken, when it was taken, what camera was used to take it, what were the f-stops, the focusing of the camera, and what was the altitude. These are the things that your iPhone puts on a photograph when it takes them. And altitude sort of threw me for a loop. Yeah, it does that. Um, when you use a program like Gemini, it's sort of ignoring what the file name is. It's looking at the metadata. Hey, I got two photographs. They were taken the same day, same time, San Francisco. We were 20 feet above sea level. Chances are it's going to be the same photograph. Okay. Okay, and that, that's when I'm doing decluttering. Okay, Richard. Okay, I read an article recently about a product called Apple Configurator 2. And supposedly it was intended for people who are in an institutional organization that manages a lot of iOS devices. And it's a central place where you can manage those. Well, they said it was also applicable to any user who may have multiple iOS devices in their home. So I downloaded it and I tried to, because I got a, a phone, and an iPad. So it's instead of downloading uh, app updates twice, for example, I could up maybe download them once and have it update both devices at the same time. I have not been able to get it to work that way. And there's no instruction manual or user guide that I've been able to find that talks about it. So I'm suggesting or I'm asking, is there a way to use this tool productively and find out how to use it? Yes. There's a guy I know. He volunteers at a local Catholic school. And he keeps their iPads in, in some sort of shape. Okay. And I'm pretty sure he doesn't do it one pad at a time. Would you be able to illuminate on that at all, Mark? What's that? Yes, we do use Apple Configurator. And the, the beauty of it is, is you can download a, an app one time, and you can hook 20 iPads up to it, and then you can do updates or you can load from that one. It actually will show you. It's a way, it's kind of like what iTunes used to do. 
yes. which they took yeah. out. Well, the, the article right. said there's Where's a the difference between. For? There's a difference. There's between documentation your, out of Apple, on Apple. You can find it. Okay. There's a difference between the original configurator right, and this configurator, configurator two. two. Yeah. But I don't know what they are and how nah, important that is. Just use configurator two. It's the newest version. But I can connect my devices. I can get it to come up showing the two devices. But every time I do it, try to do an update, it doesn't do it one. I can't figure out how to get it to do you it. You have one. to select all the devices well, that we show can, up. We can, we can, you I can't can. end. Okay. Like if 20 devices come up, do a con control A, and it selects them all, and then you go ahead and. Okay. Yeah. You know, you're not following? Well, I, I am following, and I've done it. I've done that. I've, I've highlighted the, the devices simultaneously, so the okay. little gray box comes up on each one of them. And then I try to do an app update. Okay. But when it's, apparently it's looking for an operating system update, not an app update. So it doesn't find any. It says your, your phone's uh, up to date. You can and selectively go in and tell it what to update. There's a, way, there's, right, a, well. there's a drop down in there that tells you either to update the iOS or update the apps and not the iOS. You just have to look around for it and find it. And it's going to be hard for me to show you without it actually running. Well, I've, I've got the app on my laptop. I don't know. Maybe if we have time. Maybe if the breaks. If you have time. Maybe. That's going to take more than that. Okay. <laughs> Who else was having a problem? Yeah, go ahead. Apple Mail, and uh, I'm getting more and more emails that come in in a raw state. You can see, uh, you know, color. You can see literally the, the language that looks like HTML. Is there some other application like Outlook or something that's sending out different format that Apple Mail can't read? Typically, when, when that happens, uh, it's a WinDAT file that you then have to uncompress, and there's a website I use to do that. But in your case, I think it's more likely that the Apple Mail program, that little switch that says, hey, show me HTML emails instead of the raw code, is flipped the wrong way. Under preferences? Yeah. Now, with that said, there used to be a, uh, a website, Hotwings, where the guy, he knew Apple Mail inside out, he'd answer all these questions, but the Apple Mail program is sort of spun out of control at Apple. They're not really doing due diligence and making sure stuff is 100%. And the guy got so frustrated with him, he said, I'm done. Because until Apple sends out a quality mail app, he's not going to do it anymore. Okay. So um, just be aware that many people do not use the Apple Mail program anymore because of discontinuities such as the one you described. Where you've got a switch flip and it's supposed to do this, but it's reversed from what it's supposed to do. I get other HTML mail that's spelled. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I have the same. Yeah. Well, it could be it could be malfigured to HTML. Because the same. thing to remember about passing email is that it doesn't just go from your computer to their computer. It's going through a bunch of different other things in between on the internet, and you still have some seven bit mailboxes out there. The seven bit, they're they're not eight bit, they're they're seven bit, where you you. Typically, you're really not supposed to be doing upper and lower case characters for mail that goes through a box like that. Some of the older university Unix systems are still that way. Uh, and so stuff can get stepped on in that process of going from your email provider to the email provider at the other end, or vice versa. Um, the other thing is, um, I've had, it's, I do a lot of stuff in Europe in Eastern Europe. Uh, I've had deliberately misconfigured emails that had uh, package loads in them. In other words, they, they were trying to get into my computer, my mail server, so it could then, you know, detonate and then do stuff. Uh, that's how these large botnets get formed, usually through uh, uh, mail packages. Yes, Bill. I have a question. Um, 
My greatest aggravation these days is try to untangle Yahoo and ATT SPC Global Mail because you know they're breaking apart, and I'm not sure anybody else has that problem. But um, you know, sometimes on one on one device I only get the ATT, the other one I only get the Yahoo, and I'm trying to separate them totally, trying to get rid of the ATT without dropping them into my provider. Okay. Maybe it's, maybe it's unique to me. <laughs> Anybody else has that problem? Um, no, it's not just you. Um, until the purchase of Yahoo finishes up, I don't think Verizon has finished buying them yet. That merger completes. Until that completes, they're sort of doing patchwork in the background to and that's one of the reasons why AT&T, which had contracted with Yahoo to provide the email services, is untangling that. If you're AT&T, do you want Verizon responsible to handle your email? No. Either a competitor, they're, they're your enemy. You want it to be on your own. Um, so you're talking about where it's uh, sbcglobal.net, yeah. but it's through yeah. um, I sort of wimped out, and I basically said I'm not going to use my Yahoo email anymore. Uh, it, the accounts are still there, but I just have everything redirected to another email provider. You know how you can, if, if you're uh, using a web browser, webmail, you're using a web browser to collect your mail from Yahoo, and you go into preferences where you can have it automatically forward all mail that goes to your Yahoo account, have it forward to some other account, like a Gmail account or an Apple iCloud account. That's how I got around it. Hmm. Okay, I know. It, you, you're in pain and I'm not helping you. <laughs> okay. Yes, Frida. Bill, back to the idea of mail, not giving you, giving you the raw data. That happens on my computer, but if I bring it up on my phone, I get the get it the, the right way. Yeah. So is there you know if it's the same okay. message on This is this is where you get into how are they configuring their HTML? All right. Um, okay. So I fire up my web browser on my Mac and I go to a website and I see, you know. Let's say it's Kohl's department store. And I see, okay, everything's laid out just fine. And then I go on my iPad to the same website. And I notice subtle little differences. Well, it's because they don't have one website. They have a mobile website where the HTML code is optimized to work with mobile devices such as smartphones. And then they have their regular website which is optimized to work with, you know, whatever clunky Acer satellite, Toshiba satellite pro laptop that you've got. So it could be that the people who are sending it out don't realize that they've got their HTML code optimized for mobile devices as opposed to, and something's breaking when it hits a, a, a regular PC, Mac, you know, laptop, you know, the old style computer device. I said that. Legacy. I personally like yes. Legacy. Yeah, legacy, thank you. Legacy. <laughs> but I didn't even think about that, but that's probably what's going on. Are, are they are they individual emails or is it more marketing stuff? Yeah, it's more marketing stuff. Groups and you know stuff that's good stuff. Okay. Yeah, the chances are that's what's going on there. But I can get an elder bearman email that's showing me all code and two hours later get an elder bearman one that is perfectly fine. So why is one okay. showing me code and one this is, this stuff is all automated. Okay. It's all automated. It's not crafted one at a time by a human being and they check to see it's hit the button uh, the magic Sausage machine stops, it starts, they throw in the stuff, and out comes the emails that get plowed out. So, look at, have you read an online news article? And notice how you have grammatical and spelling errors that, 
That's because a lot of this stuff is automated now. It's not, there's no human being doing, you know, copy smithing on this stuff. No one's typing it out, they're speaking into it too, and there could be some conversion to the voice. No, I'm that. talking about fully automated. It's, it's, you've got a machine that's getting feeds from AP and Reuters. It comes in, it takes two of the articles that are from two different sources, does some sort of transmorphification on it. So that they don't have to credit AP or Reuters, and then they, you know, it's slammed out on their web page. No human beings involved. No coding monkeys. No, it was, it just all. Yeah. So is this a rudimentary form of uh, AI that they're trying to do this yeah. through artificial intelligence to put stuff? No, together? I would prefer to use the metaphor of a Victorian. Steam, a steam contraction. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You know, and depending on whether Tommy was shoveling the coal or was that too long at the pub last night or not, you know, the, okay. the tension on the belts may not be the same. Okay. Yes, okay, I'm being warned. Okay, so we're going to say that we're done. I'll give Bill Hal the last one. Did anybody answer the Apple configurator documentation support. Just where it is. No, nobody answered that. Okay. The breaking over I've got the link for it for you. What's that? Apple configurator documentation support. Yeah, I just sent him two emails. Oh, two. Apple configurator two. Yeah. It says it's Apple's website. It says Apple configurator. Yeah, there's one for two point three. I sent you an email. Okay. Thank you. Last word. Am I the only person in the room that wish that they actually did documentation on how programs work now? <laughs> like a book, you know, a PDF, a pamphlet, and something, as opposed to, oh, it's intuitively obvious. Just <laughs> put it on your phone and give us the money and just check our help. I'm getting tired of the pictogram, you know, sort of the idea type of stuff that I get with. Mm -hmm. With objects, you know, I got a set of headphones no the other day. No written instructions whatsoever. Okay. Just a series of graphic things that you're supposed to interpret. And, yeah. you know, universal. Yeah. It's universal. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. Universal. They're following Confusion. the military. Because the military. Excuse me, you got a ticket that's never going to be called. Don't give you the words anymore. You guys remember the field manual? Because one part has to be Okay. But uh, you know, the reason why they do that is they don't know what language the soldier will be using. You know, you've got a weapon that's supposed to be used by anybody. Across the board. Yes. Yeah. I agree to that, but I have to say in many respects they've dumbed down that stuff yeah. to the point of, you know, look at look at a picture and follow the pictures and you can see. When, when I had done a tour, I have done that for 50 years. Lima? Lima? Lima. 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 Anyway, the ones. Abrams, they were working. And they were showing me a, a manual that's supposed to go with the tank that's for export to the uh, Republic of Korea. I thought I was looking at Egyptian hieroglyphics. You know, it's like the little man, and he does this, and then they show the little man doing this, and it's like, okay, this is how you tension the, the treads. Okay. Yep. Okay. So with that said, this is why uh, trading services like Lynda.com, uh, like Snowboom, they're, they're another very good training place for uh, all things Apple. That's why these things, these places are important because the manufacturer is not giving us that kind of training anymore. Okay, so let me get off of my soapbox here. We're time to do raffle. Yep. Okay. Should we do a presentation it's on today, or should we just chit chat? Yeah. Hey, Bill. Yeah. You, you skipped over wanted and for sale. Oh, I'm sorry. My apologies. Who bought stuff that they're either looking for or that they're selling? I didn't bring it, but uh, somebody's looking for a very capable 
desktop machine. I've got a, an early 2008 iMac, uh, all aluminum. It, I, I upgraded it with a one terabyte drive. It's got four gigs of RAM. Uh, looking to get 400. Right now, it's running El Cap. And that's uh, as far as it can that's, go. That's yeah. Okay. And what else have you got there? Oh, well, if you're interested in when we go that far, uh, I've still got the uh, uh, 12, 12 megapixel point and shoot Olympus camera and a, uh, a Jot Touch pen for an iPad. Okay. So, anybody so, interested in seeing it? If you're looking for a good quality but legacy, legacy digital camera, 12 megapixel. Okay, on the screen. I'm displaying okay on the screen. What are we going to cover? Turn your mic on. Pardon? Turn the mic on. Mike is back on. Can you hear me now? No, it's not on. Can you hear me now? No. No. Testing. One, two, three. How can 30 people yell no? Now it's on. Yeah, now it's on. Now it's on. I can hear it. It's like the USB, you've got a USB flash drive, you go to put it in, it doesn't fit, so you flip it over and it doesn't fit, and you flip it over and it fits. Sometimes three times. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to be going over best of breed web browsers for Mac OS, iOS, best of breed search engines, organizing your bookmarks, also known as your favorites, and private browsing. Okay, so th there's a whole bunch of stuff that I originally had in the presentation and I went, you know, it's not going to be applicable to everybody, so I'll just make sure that I've got all these other supplemental materials. For those of you who want to be uh, a little bit more safe and secure when you're surfing the web, I've got a document called 10 Steps for Safe Web Browsing, Web Surfing. I've got another one for, this would be like what I call normative vocabulary. You, you want to know what the words actually mean, what, what they are. And that would be basic web concepts. Uh, and then I've got another document, which is the best Mac web browsers of 2017, where they, they do the pros and the cons of the different web browsers. And then another one where it's the best search engines of 2018. Again, the pros and cons of the various search engines. And then I have a, uh, uh, the uh, For Dummies series of books. I have a Internet for Dummies cheat sheet, which again is sort of a, you know, even though we've been doing this stuff for all these years, sometimes there's little bits of information that just didn't stick in. Reading something like a cheat sheet can help fill that, that gap. And then last but not least, the Safari app, the ultimate guide, where they go into all of the stuff they changed with the Safari web browser, where they moved what and what the different buttons and such do. Okay. That stuff is not in this presentation. So let's start out with web browsers. Okay. What is a web browser? All right. it, I, I will tell you that it is not unusual for me to encounter people. They've been using a web browser for all these years. They don't know what it's doing. They think all of that wonderful stuff they're seeing is in their own computer. They don't realize that it's searching someone else's computer. Uh, so, example, think of the internet. <coughs> People get internet, information highway, all of these different metaphors that are totally, completely inaccurate. All right? 
The internet is what I call a connection of computers. Now, I didn't say collection, I said connection. You know how you can have these collective nouns like a murder of crows, a congress of baboons? Okay. No, these are these are, you know, you know, a school of fish. Okay. This is what I've been using the last 10 years to explain the internet. It's a connection of computers. It means it's a group of computers, but they're all connected, but not necessarily talking all the time to each other. A web browser lets your computer look at stuff that's on another computer. And a web browser is using a particular file format and protocol for sharing information that's called HTML, Hypertext Markup Language. Okay? Now, not all computers are web servers, okay? Because some are file servers, some are stores. But many of the computers that are on the internet, not the vast majority, but many of the computers that are on the internet are web servers. Those are computers specifically with information that you can search using a web browser. Okay, so web browser is a computer program or application that allows your device to connect and interact with internet websites. So these are other computers that have their stuff that they're going to let you look at. Okay, it's not on your computer, it's on their computer. And through the internet, somehow you're able to look at it. Doesn't sound like that big of a deal, but oh my lord, did it change the world. <laughs> okay, so the other thing that's important to know is that current modern web browsers are loaded with all sorts of new technologies to securely transfer that information back and forth. Because there's a lot of people on the internet that may be between your computer and that other computer that are trying to steal your information or monitor you in some way, shape, or form. Sometimes for nefarious purposes, usually they want to track you because they can make money off of you. In the same way that if you are walking through a, a high-tech grocery store, you know, there's cameras, not just for shoplifters, but also just to watch how you look at stuff on the shelves. And, you know, people get paid, they get paid big bucks to, to tell them, oh, the consumer does this, and you want to get the plant grain shelves to do this and that. Okay. So, very simple concept. Most of us on Mac use the Safari web browser, but you don't have to use Safari unless you really like Safari. Safari in the past has been sort of, uh, you know, it, it comes with the Mac and it works, but it's not necessarily the latest and greatest. That has changed over time. Right now, the Safari, the technology that's in the Apple web browser, Safari, is world class. It is, it is an extremely fast, efficient, secure web browser. Sometimes we want to use other stuff. So if you don't like Safari, the three best of breed would be Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox, and another one that many people don't know about is from Europe. It's called Opera. Opera. Now, if you had all three of them open in front of you in different windows, you'd say, oh, they look pretty much alike in terms of where your back and forward arrows are and where your search bar is. Okay. Now on a Mac that's true. On a PC, what you're going to discover though is you don't have menu bars anymore. Okay. Now, there's one thing that makes Opera world class on top of the others. It has built into it free VPN service. Free VPN service. So if I've got Opera on my Mac, there's a little button I can click and it will anonymize my website connection. 
so they won't know where I actually am. And you can, and the way it's set up uh, when you're using it in North America is you can have it so that it sort of rolls the dice and picks the country that you're exiting from. Typically, it'll be Germany or France or the United Kingdom, or you can stipulate for it to have it originating from Canada or in the U.S. Or Sweden. Or Sweden. Yeah, but you're not going to know. They're not going to know where your computer is in the world without doing a lot of hard work. Yeah, because I got a notice I just logged in from Sweden. Yeah. Okay. Now, the disadvantage of using a VPN, let's say you have purchased things like music from the iTunes store, okay, and you want to buy some more music. If you're using a VPN service and you're buying the music, you may be buying it from the iTunes store in Italy or Germany or France. So later on when you go to bring that into your Mac, when you're saying you're from the US, it's going to say, no, 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 I'm looking at all the stuff that you bought and I don't see it there for your account for the US. You never bought that. Well, it is there. It's just, it's in the Italy store, not in the U.S. store. So you'd have to VPN in from Italy to be able to get it. Yeah. Uh, you made a comment, I think, a long time ago for me on Opera. Is there a version that works in VPC computers? Uh, there used to be. It no longer is available. Um, if you're going to... Send me an email. I'll send you my top list of web browsers for power PC computers. Okay. Yes? When you use your VPN, if you're using uh, access points that's within the United States, it's still using the Apple Store in this country, right? No, when you're doing VPN, it sets up a secure connection between your computer and the VPN server. Right, and particularly, in particular, mine are closed. Logs in through in Chicago. Okay. So I wouldn't have any problem with that with the Apple Store being in the United States. <coughs> it depends on where they routed you. Okay. Well, he said okay. Oh. So I can be connecting to a VPN server that's in the U.S., but they may reroute your traffic to some place out of ICE. So you don't know where they're going after yeah. your optimal. I'm using that a vast VPN in the optimal in Chicago. Yeah. Okay. Now, so. VPN, think you're in one of those, uh, having a senior moment, can't remember the team, a Mission Impossible. It's a Mission Impossible movie, and they're trying to track where this guy, the money is, and if they see it bouncing around the world, it's sort of like what VPN does. In other words, they don't know where the guy is, or you know. So, Opera is the only one that has a, a free VPN service built into it. What does VPN stand for? Virtual Private Network. Okay, do you want my real world explanation of a VPN? Okay, your computer is a commode. Okay, you want to send something from your commode to somebody else's commode. Right. Well, if we just flush it down, it goes through the internet, and there's a lot of good stuff down in the sewer system. So a VPN would be, we're shoving, we put a cap on a pipe, on a, on a tube, we shove it down, it goes all the way through the internet, comes up and the other guys come out, and then we take the caps off. So we're sending it through the internet, but it's through our own little pipe, our own little tube, and it Nobody else can get to it, and it isn't with all the other excrement and stuff that's down in the sewer system, and the motor oil, and the fat birds, and all the other stuff. So that's Bill Herrick's explanation of VPN. That's a great explanation. Okay. They're often used to connect to work networks. So, you know, I set up a VPN to my office. It's if I'm on that network. All my stuff goes through my computer to my office network. Now, these services like this have the additional feature you go out from there. Yeah. So it looks like you're coming from where their service is. Now, reasons why people would want to have their stuff be extra special secure 
I have a customer, she's a radiologist. She's at home. She doesn't want to drive back into Kettering or Miami to go look at the stuff. They set up a VPN between her computer at home and the one that's near the MRI uh, imaging room. And she's able to look at the stuff on her laptop without having to drive in there. But because it's medical information covered under HIPAA, it has to be kept very, very secure. They can't just email it to her. Remember, there's no expectation of privacy with emails. It's like a postcard, you know? You write, wish you having a good, great time, glad you're not here. Anybody in the postal system can look at that postcard as it goes from you to the recipient. It's the same thing with emails. No expectation of privacy. Okay, moving right along. Okay, now that was on a Mac computer. You know, Mac Mini, lap, you know, MacBook Pro, iMac, you know, regular computer. On your mobile devices, your iPhones, your tablets, your iPod Touches, you don't have to use the Safari app to browse the web. There are other choices. I mean, the Safari app's okay, but some of the other choices I think are better. Now, the top three, Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox. Did you know you could put Firefox on your, your okay? And Microsoft Edge. That's Microsoft's replacement for Internet Explorer. Uh, excuse me, Internet Explorer. Okay. So on your phones, on your tablets, you have other choices. Now you may be thinking, well, why would I want to have other choices? Um, Real-world situation. You have an iPad, you use it for all your email, you're trying to log into a Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, champion, I'm trying to think of all the different uh, you know, health care that's out there. Okay. Champus, is it Champus or Champion? Anyway. Champus is no longer. Okay, well, they may not work right with Safari, but if you use Microsoft Edge or use Google Chrome or use Firefox, Oh, all of a sudden everything works. Okay, so it's good they have choices. Okay, so Safari, best of breed. Now, before we go to questions, I just want to make a comment. Phyllis Parker gave me some very, very good advice. I had done a presentation on a product that I thought was total crap. She said, why did you go through the whole thing and not just start at the beginning and tell us it was total crap? Okay. Well, it was something that had been sent for review and we had already agreed that we would, you know, present on it. But I took it to heart. Life is short. We have no time for crap. So I'm just showing you the ones that are best of breed. They're, they're all good quality things. Okay, so questions about web browsers. Okay, how many of you use Google Chrome? How many of you use Firefox? How many of you use Opera? Okay. Okay, now what's the question, Jim? On your message in identifying this meeting, yeah. you listed five different browsers and we don't have the Yeah, browser. I dropped one off. Why? That was I dropped it off because uh, I found out that they were not properly, uh, there, there's certain code which is under the uh, GPL licensing and they were not following the GPL. That they, they had used someone else's code, left it, uh, and they were not acknowledging the use of the WebKit uh, rendering engine. Okay. So, um, my rule is if Someone isn't following good manners and protocol. They're probably not a good person to hang out with. Okay. And who's that? And it, it was the uh, the people that are uh, promoting this new web browser called Evolve. Yeah. He's the one that had Opera, wasn't it? Hmm? He worked with Opera, didn't he? The man who did Evolve, didn't he? Um, there's
there's stuff in court in Europe. Yeah. Okay, at this point. What's the so it's just like one of the one of the number one uh, audio players, movie players on the Google store is a copy of VLC V Land, but they filed off the names. They make no allusions uh, uh, to the people who actually make Video Land in France. And they're charging for it, and video land is free. So it'd be like me going in, and uh, let's say Frank has written this really great pamphlet on how to shop all of these, you know, what to look for. So I take Frank's pamphlet, which he's handing out to people free at the door of all of these, and I go, oh, and I change the title, and I put my name on it, and I start charging 50 cents for it. Okay? It's no. All right, so anyway, moving right along. The other thing is search engines. Yes, Kathy. Um, I had an issue with my internet and stuff last several months. But what I did the other night is I got on the Ares because I've got a surfboard modem mm -hmm. slash router. I tried to get, the guy talked me through it and he had got me on, uh, I tried to get on Firefox and I couldn't get where I needed to go. I tried Safari and I couldn't get, I got the page, but it wasn't complete, mm -hmm. it just wasn't. He had, I finally, he says, uh, Google Chrome, I went into my apps, pulled up the app, got on there, and that's when I found all the stuff that he'd been talking about. Now, what is the best um, <coughs> search engine in yeah. the I was, I would always use Firefox. Okay, so let me go back here. So we're not on we're not on search engines, we're on web browsers. Web browsers. Search engine that's a little bit different. What you were doing, they may not have explained what, what you were doing, but in that surfboard cable mode at CSU DSU, there's a little website engine. And you can talk to that website and change the settings. Okay. Because he zapped me out. I couldn't figure out how I was going to get back on the internet without the internet. So. Yeah. And so Safari couldn't talk to that website correctly. And neither could Firefox. And neither could Firefox, but Google Chrome could. It has to do with subtle differences in rendering engines. Because when you go to a website, it's got to render that website. So it, little pieces come in. You don't get the website page all in one piece. It's all some assembly required. <laughs> and the first thing you get is a PDF thing that comes through. It's not portable document format. It's page description format. And it's the layout of where all these little pieces are supposed to be. Think of it like a jigsaw puzzle. It's the picture on the box of what the puzzle's supposed to look like when you're done. Okay. Well, your Firefox couldn't figure out how to do the puzzle. Safari couldn't figure out how to do the puzzle. Google Chrome could. So does that make Google Chrome better for this instance, or Google Chrome good better than both of them? In this particular instance, the best browser was Google Chrome. Okay. But, but not, it's not always going to be better. Not always, because websites are created by human beings for the most part. <laughs> and human beings always want to tweak it. Okay, so if, if I'm going to a website and uh, the uh, website creator is registered with GoDaddy and they're using the GoDaddy cool tools to create the website, I know it's going to be 100% compliant with Google Chrome, and with Firefox, and with Opera. Safari, maybe not. Okay. If I'm on a legacy website, something from the 1980s, and they originally set it up to work well with Mozilla, or Netscape, or Internet Ex Explorer, okay, a modern web browser may not work well with that website because of the way they have the information set up. Bill. Yeah. Another thing in browsers, I use Google Chrome for, uh, for my stream off of uh, Vicky.com mm -hmm. because 
it recognizes the uh, flash in there. Drama mm -hmm. finger doesn't recognize it. I have to use Firefox. Mm -hmm. This is the way they're set up. So that's when we're talking about using our web browsers as entertainment. So we're using the web browser to watch a Netflix movie or we're watching you know, Korean drama from Vicky.com, etc. They have all these other little software technologies such as Flash and, and uh, QuickTime and, and others. Silver, 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 out here. Silver Light, silver light I think it's Microsoft's. And there's, and there's a whole bunch of new ones that just have the names of the numbers. Uh, different web browsers work better with this one versus that. So there's, so when somebody says, what's the best web browser? I go, the one that works with the website that you want to connect to. Okay. Bill? Yeah. What's the difference between, in terms of anonymity, what's the difference between DuckDuckGo and Opera? Okay, so now we're talking about search engines. Okay, so let's get over to search engines. Okay, now. Is an Opera also a browser? No, Opera, I mean, Opera is a web browser. Is a DuckDuckGo a browser? DuckDuckGo has an app that you can put on your phone that will go directly to their website, but they are a search engine. Just like Google Chrome, is a web browser. Google search is the search engine from Google. Yeah, browser. well it's 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 DuckDuckGo making it easy for people. It's their search engine and browser put together. There's an app you can put on your your phone, whether it's an Android or a, an iPhone. From Google, that's just called Google. It's Google Chrome with the search engine in it, so that it's it's uh, more doing more search than it is web browsing. So, so in terms of anonymity, what's the difference between? Okay. Let me first tell people what a search engine is. Okay. All right. So you've got your web browser, and you've got this. Connection of computers that are out there, and you're looking for something. Okay, so you're looking for information about uh, mucus relief. Okay, or you're looking for information about you want to buy some shoes and you want them to be New Balance, but you want to see what colors they come. So, are you seeing something about this information that we're looking for? It's very personal information. Okay. So now they know that I like New Balance shoes and they know that I may have mucus problems. <laughs> but what if I'm looking at financial information or other medical information? They can very quickly build up a picture about this person. Profile. Profile. Okay. So search engines reveal more about you than just the stuff you're looking for. Okay, I'm already up to 12 o'clock, so I'm, what I'm going to suggest is that, uh, let me get the abbreviated part of it. Okay, search engines. The three top search engines in terms of quality of search, DuckDuckGo, Microsoft Bing, and DuckPile Search, other than Google. You don't have to use Google. The only one that actually treasures your privacy that protects you from it protects your anonymity is DuckDuckGo because they don't keep any of the information that you're searching for and they don't tell the source that they got it from who was asking. So if I do a search on Google, let's say I'm looking for red new New Balance running shoes. For the next two weeks, every time I'm on any sort of website, it's going to get ads for red running shoes off on the side. Because they kept that information. They have it connected to me. The other thing is, DuckDuckGo doesn't just use one search engine. They don't do the search themselves. They use other search engines. So 
instead of me going just to Google and getting a result, remember, Google gets money to change the search results. You know, put those things up at the very top that are the ads. DuckDuckGo sends the search out to about, uh, they're up to about 40 different search engines and bring back the aggregate search. What's the difference then between DuckDuckGo search for your red shoes and going to Opera and using the VPN for the shoes? Okay. Uh, if I do the search with the VPN, I may still have a cookie on my computer that's telling them about me. See? So they can't tell by the basis of the phone call where I was calling from, but in the background they can hear, hey, he's in Dayton, Ohio. You know, the town fire in the background. So if you want to truly anonymize your search, you would use both something like DuckDuckGo and a VPN service. So they don't know where the search originated from on the planet, and they don't know who was asking for the information. You're still going to connect somewhere anyway, and they may track you. Yeah. Oh, you're always going to. Well, you have to be tracked at some uh, to a certain extent, because how are they going to send the answer back to you unless they know where to send it? Yeah. Could you explain to people how they can change their settings to duck that yes. on the iOS? Okay. If you're, i got to have it in front of me. Ah. It's in, it's in uh, settings. Yeah, I'm on my Safari, mind. and you look there and it'll say search engine, and you can change it to Okay, depending on which version of iOS you're running. Let's see. Okay, so if you're using Safari as your. Hello, oh, well, Yeah, you would go into settings on your iOS device, you tap on Safari. And then you would, underneath where it says Siri search, you have a thing that says search engine, and you have four choices for Safari. And that is Google, Yahoo, Bing, and DuckDuckGo. So settings first. Right, settings first. Then scroll down until you see Safari. Okay. Tap on Safari. Uh -huh. And then once you've got Safari tap, underneath where it says Siri and search, you have a whole section where they talk about just plain old search. And that first one would be search engine, and you tap on that, and then it gives you the four choices. The one with the check mark next to it is the one that's selected. That yes. is the same procedure for OS versus iOS? Uh, for OS, you would be going into your, your preferences for the app, and you'd be going to the... You know, thing. Yeah, you do it. Escape here. Okay, launch in Safari. Okay, so here's Safari. And I go up to my menu bar. I like menu bars. And I would go to preferences. And then I've got a thing right after passwords that's called search. And we have right here the four choices that I can do for Safari. Google, Yahoo, Bing, or DuckDuckGo. You can't add another one? Um, in Safari, you can do it, but it's not easy. You can add other search engines. In other web browsers, much, much easier to add other search engines. Like good search. So for example, I have a search engine that I have in my uh, Microsoft Edge web browser where it searches Amazon.com. So that, I tend to use that particular web browser when I'm buying stuff or shopping. So I go, why should I search the whole internet if I'm, if I'm going to buy it from Amazon anyway? So with that said, I don't want to run much longer, folks. So let the last two things to know, it's very simple. You have all these favorites and bookmarks you've saved in your web browser. And you know you've got duplicates and triplicates and stuff that's in there that you haven't touched in years. You can go to your bookmark manager and clean that up. Put them in folders, get rid of duplicates, get rid of triplicates. Good thing to know. And last but not least, 
There's another feature with all of the modern web browsers. It's called private browsing. What it means is it doesn't leave any uh, indications of where you went and what you did on your computer. And also, it doesn't use your cookies, your existing information. Correct. So they don't know who you have been. And that's called private browsing. And that's another way to maintain some uh, privacy and anonymity when you're doing web search. However, for visiting sites, yes, if you use private browsing on one machine, like in Google, and you have another machine who also uses Google, they would show up there. Yeah, you, there's other things you have to turn off. Okay. So I'm going to say again, I apologize for. Bad use of time. That's great. Okay. Good use of time. I thank you for your patience. You were very, very. Well.